price I couldn't pay. If somebody asks you why you go to church every single night like you have been doing, you can just answer them. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. If they still have questions, quote to them 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. If they still have questions, give them Revelations 4, 11. Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Can we just lift him up again with those hands raised? And can we worship him with all our heart, soul, and strength? Lord, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to receive glory and honor and power and majesty and might and riches. All of it belongs to you, O God. Lord, we lift you up. We do this, Lord, with a cheerful heart. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. This is the one y'all have been looking for. Amen, this is the last one. Aren't you thankful that we've had an opportunity to be in the house of God so many times together? We have been living out Scripture because the Bible says, forsake not the assemblings of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but even more so as you see the day approaching. And that is what we have been doing. And I am fully aware you're probably tired, <laughs> but it is, a, it is not a sacrifice, it's an offering. And I'm so glad, I'm just so humbled to be with people who have offered their bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. You guys have just been just so humbling. It's amazing to be in the house of God with hungry people, and I'm thankful that I got to be with you. I'm inviting you now to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We're going to read 28, 29, and 30. As the Lord was dealing with me about this and trying to navigate, I almost walked away from this sermon because I talk about Moses in it, and I'm like, God, I've been talking a lot about Moses this week. I promise. I know other scriptures. <laughs> But I'm not here to impress you anyway, so I guess that's okay. <laughs> Amen. I've talked a lot about prayer, spirituality, and this is not what I'm going to minister tonight, but I just can't help but say it. Studying our Bibles is so important. Just like your natural man has to inhale and exhale, your spirit man exhales when we pray, inhales when we read the Bible. And if you're only doing one or the other, you're hyperventilating. If you want to have a true depth, if you want to have a true walk with God to where all the oxygen your spiritual man needs, it, it encompasses reading his Bible and prayer. And so that's just, I have to throw that out there lest I, I not be balanced and make you think it's all about prayer. It, it takes both. It takes both. Romans chapter 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. How many love God? We got some good news here for you. It all works together for good for you. To those who are the called, that's where we get messed up. Ah, Brother Holloway, I don't know if I'm called though. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. I figured it was a pretty good idea on the last night to preach from the most controversial passage in our Bible. <laughs> we're going to we're going to dive right into it. I want to minister to us tonight though on these lines that he gives here. You know, he talks about predestined to be conformed to the image, those whom he predestined he called. And so the Greek here in Romans 8 is really hard to read because Paul is going back and forth between past tense and future tense and he's writing in a way that it looks like they're both happening at the same time. And this is why the Greek is so hard and the reason why this passage is so controversial because Paul is acting like the past and the future are right now. <laughs> Makes no sense, does it? Well, it will. So let's, let's get ready. I want to minister to us tonight, not yet, but already. Would you lift up your hands? And let's talk to the Lord for a moment. Heavenly Father, you are the eternal God. You are here with us now, Lord, but in heavenly places, you're still looking at Eden. 
Lord, where you sit, you can still see the cross. Lord, where you're sitting, you can see each and every individual in this room while also looking at the future. Lord, nothing is beyond your watchful eye. Lord, you are large enough to sit in all time because time does not exist where you live. I pray that you would help us to grasp your eternal nature tonight because when we understand how eternal you are, it helps us with our faith. Lord, I'm here tonight to increase someone's faith, to bring them up a little higher. Lord, to the place of faith. Lord, we give you honor for what you're gonna do tonight. I cannot do this without your help. Lord, I surrender myself to you that you would equip me for this evening, Jesus. I honor you, I thank you, I give you glory and praise because you're the only one who is worthy of it. And the only way we can do anything of any value is if you come in and help us. We thank you, Jesus. In the mighty name we pray. Everyone clap your hands. Amen. Look at somebody before you're seated and tell them, not yet, but already. Amen. You can be seated. The scene takes place in the Bible, if I can use my imagination for a few moments. I imagine the scene taking place with an early morning as courageous rays of sunlight begin to spill over the horizon, cascading a blend of gold and orange and pink hues over the landscape as night begins to turn over its shift to the morning. If you listen in with your imagination, you could possibly hear the gentle sound of sheep as they can be heard chewing the dew-covered ground, and one of them lets out just a gentle bah. As the golden hue of morning light and the sounds of sheep creep through a window, I can imagine looking at a humble hut, and as I look through that little window, I could see a man rising from his bed. He stretches out his arms wide, and a, a yawn involuntarily comes forth from his mouth. He rubs the sleep away from his eyes, and he reaches over, and he grabs a handmade, very archaic tunic made of animal skins. He puts his head through it, puts his arms through it, he grabs a leather belt, wraps it around his waist. He reaches down on the floor and he grabs some sandals that are very aged and he puts them onto his dirty feet and he prepares himself for the day. He walks from his bed and in this small humble hut, it's all one room together. He walks across and he grabs some animal skins and he lays it out flat and he can grab, I can see him grabbing quail eggs, putting them onto that animal skin, maybe a morsel of very, very flat, not appetizing looking bread. He wraps it together as he's preparing for his day. Not long after, his wife rises from her sleep. She walks into the room as she sees her husband preparing for the day that is set before him. She looks at him and I wish that I were there, but I can imagine, I can see his face, I can hear her voice. She analyzes her husband who she knows well and today she can see She's reading his, his persona that he seems a little off. So she consoles him. And I imagine if all of this took place, these words had to have been said. Moses, I know that it don't seem like it's a glorious task to have watched my father's sheep for the past 40 years. I, I know that you probably thought that you were special because you were raised in a palace and you were saved from the Nile River I know that this is probably frustrating for you because it seems like your life was going somewhere, but don't be discouraged. Maybe this was all for some reason. I can see if this actually took place, Moses smiling. He kisses his wife, Zipporah, sweetly on the lips as he takes from her hand the leather hide stuffed with food. And then all of a sudden you hear it. Who, 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 who am I kidding? I, I, I'm just M M Moses, a simple hi hi hired shepherd. He pushes back the veil that acts as a door to that humble hut that is shielding their comfortable life from the wilderness that they're living within in that arid desert. He enters into the field of his labor. He whistles to the sheep that are not his to which they respond by following him out to pasture. There's nothing special here, nothing divine. You certainly aren't looking upon anything glorious. Just another day. But I imagine if the words were actually said from precious Zipporah to Moses, I have to think that Moses thought about him all day. As he's leading out those sheep to pasture, 
he had to have thought to himself, maybe this is all for a reason. Nevertheless, the task at hand in the field of labor and the work for the day has no respect for your wishful thinking. Come on, Moses, get it together. You're not special. You're just out here a hired hand walking your father-in-law's sheep out to pasture. So he does as he has done for 40 years now. He walks out, sets up on a hill, and he looks over those sheep. And as the hours of the day go by, the sun begins its journey to the opposite horizon. Moses now, after a very boring day, not special, not glorious, nothing to, good to see here. He whistles back to them to which they follow and he's bringing them back to the watering well before it gets too late in the day to bring them for their evening drink of water before putting them away so that he can do it all over again the next day. But this day, something strange happens as Moses is walking home. On this particular day, you have to understand that shepherds are very, uh, they are very much in a pattern. They have, they have rhythms. They have things they do every day. This day, Moses walks back walks past, I'm sure, the same bush he has seen many times. And little would he know that the attention, the focused attention of a great God has likely planted a bush there many years in the past, and today that bush is finally ready to do what it was designed to do. And that bush is now baptized with fire. And Moses walks past it, he sees it off into a distance, and he can't help himself. What is this great sight he turns aside to see this. Little would he know that it was there all along just for him, that God's watchful eye knew the patterns of a shepherd, and he was designing all of this, foreordained way in the past. God had a plan, because if not, Moses would have went down in a little ark. But God knew something that Moses could never possibly understand. Moses could not possibly fathom the attention to detail God that is about to talk with him has been doing something for the past 40 years. And little would he know that watching somebody else's sheep is all part of the plan. He walks past and he draws aside to see it. And out of curiosity, he approaches a little bit. And all of a sudden, the unexplainable bursts forth. And he hears these words, Moses, Moses. And let's just be honest. That's a little weird. I don't know this bush. He ain't invited me to his Christmas party. I've never met this bush. How does that bush know my name? But if a bush talks, all you can do is approach, y'all. That's what you do. And so Moses starts walking near that bush. And this bush got a, got a little bit of authority. Come no closer. Where you're about to walk is holy. Who is this bush? <laughs> Sure enough, Moses, obedient, takes off his shoes, those humble shoes, and he approaches. Little would he know that where he has been for the past 40 years cannot go where God is calling him right now. So where you've been walking has no allowance where you're going, so take off where you've been. Humbled, takes off his shoes, terrified and in shock, he begins to approach this glorious light. And as he approaches, the voice speaks something quite strange. He says, I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Who expects the divine in such a moment as this, in a moment that is not special, not divine, not glorious? It's just another bush in the arid wilderness. I am just another man with the same sandals as everyone else. I'm another man watching someone else's sheep. There's nothing special happening here. Little would he know that wherever God falls, doesn't matter the mundane of the context, when God falls there, the mundane gets transformed into glory. And Moses would understand in this moment, and I said it earlier this week, that if the bush can hold the glory, what on earth can Moses do with it? The Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I, I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send you. I will send this man. 
the man who's wearing a humble tunic, the man who's been watching somebody else's sheep, the man with a stutter, I'm sending you to do this. Hold up. T, you're God, right? You're the God of heaven. You're the God who sees. You're the God who knows. You're the God who hears. I think you, I think you might have a stutter. You're the one who come down here. You're the God who sees. You're the God who said you're going to deliver them with an outstretched hand. You're sending me? That seems horribly inefficient. I think, like, if you could do this, why don't you come down and do it? Oh, no, no, it's my good pleasure to drive the vehicle of humanity to execute my will. That's the way I'm going to do this. If I didn't want you, I would have never made you. If I wanted you at another time in history, Moses, I would have put you there. If I wanted you on a pandemic, Moses, that's where you would have ended up. I don't need you for a pandemic. I got a whole group of people that can handle that. I need you here now, nobody else, just you. You're the one that I'm calling. You're the one that I've anointed. But I have a stutter. He says this in verse 11. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? An insecure Moses is having trouble understanding that the whole God of a universe is calling him with this simple reply. Who am I? To which God says, I will be with you. The I will be right there, if you read it in the original language, it is his name. When Moses says, who am I? God says, I will be. Well, I don't think you're catching that. Who am I? I will be. What about my stutter? I will be with your mouth. Who it's your name? I will be what I will be. Every time Moses gave forth an argument, God responded with his name every single time. How do I do it? My name. How do I do this? My name. What do I say to them? My name. What about my, my insecurities? My name. What about my stutter? My name. Everything you do in word or in deed, do it in my name. I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, hold on, say that again. Here's the sign that I will be with you when you bring them out. I haven't even said yes yet. I'm still trying to figure this old push thing out. I, I, I haven't even talked to Sapporo yet. I need to get her permission if I'm going to go back there because last time I went to Egypt, it didn't go well. I need to go ask my wife. No, no. Here's the sign that I will be with you when you succeed. How do you know I'm going to succeed? How can you be so certain about the future when we're still right here at this bush? I will be with you. When I'm with you, it is successful. When I am with you, it works. I wouldn't have called you make you fail. All things work together for the good to those who love God, who are the called. Moses, I am calling you here at this bush. This is the point of your calling. To those to whom I have called, I have predestined. If you will walk with me, it's going to work. Here's the sign. You're going to succeed. Uh, are you sure I can trust you? We just met. Go ask the elders about me and they'll tell you about Abraham. They'll tell you about Isaac. They'll tell you about Jacob. Talk to them a little bit. Go, go learn from them about Joseph. Go find out. Go listen to the stories. Little did Moses know that the glory that was being revealed to him in a burning bush was only the introduction to the ultimate plan. Moses could not recognize in his finite mind that the reason why God was so confident in making statements concerning the future was because God was already looking at Moses standing on that very mountain in the future. Moses, if you say yes to me and you die to your will, and surrender that will to me. I will walk with you and I'll bring you right back here. Moses, I can already see you here on the mountain if you say yes and submit. 
I already see it working out for your good because I am the eternal God who doesn't live just here at this moment next to you at a bush. I am already in the future as well. I can tell that this is a lot. I don't, I don't understand what you're saying, Brother Holloway. Hear me clearly. Let me be quite plain. The glory that you have felt in a revival is good. But what if I told you that it is only the introduction to the ultimate plan that God has for individuals in this room, each person, that God looks at you, met, met with you here this week, looked at you face to face and said, I know you better than you know yourself. You say yes to me and I will walk with you and it will work. Everything I'm asking of you, I don't set you up to fail. I don't set you up to fall flat on your face. If I have called you to any level of ministry, and trust me, everyone in this room has a calling. So I'm speaking to 100% of the room right now. Whatever I have put on you to do, it works. If you have had a burden this week to teach a Bible study, you mark my word, you're going to teach that Bible study. If you have felt a burden and a calling to lead a small group, you're going to lead that small group. It's going to work. God walks with us. God has a way of going before us. Let, let me... Let me nail it down just a little bit more. I talked about it today. The very Moses that we're talking about right now that I talked about this morning that was at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, do you know what mountain that was? It was the same mountain where God met with Mo, where, where he met with him at the burning bush. Re, if you read it in Hebrew, it's interesting. He met with him at the burning seneh tree. And that's where God called him was at the, the Hebrew word is seneh tree. Then he meets with him in Exodus 19 at the burning Sinai mountain. It's the same word, burning tree, burning mountain. Here, God calls him at the bush. Over there, God justified him at the mountain on Pentecost. Moses, you're hiding your face from me here. Don't settle for the bush because what you can't possibly know is that mountains can burn. Don't say, you know what, boy, I remember back in 1987, God met with me at that bush, and boy, I just, it's not like it used to be. No, it just continues to multiply. He leads us from glory to glory. It gets bigger and better from the bush. God is calling him at the bush, but he's like, oh, wait till you see the mountain burn. Don't settle for a bush when we know mountains have the ability to burn. And don't settle for a mountain when Moses' face can shine. For those to whom he called at a bush, he justified at a mountain, and he glorified Moses coming off the mountain. That was the ultimate plan, and God saw every step of the way if Moses would surrender to the plan. It works. It all works if we can die to ourselves, which is why Jesus taught us his prayer. Pray this every day. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not my, I'm gonna die every single day to my will, my plans. I am going to let God be in charge of this thing and he's gonna get me from the call to the justified to the glorified. Don't settle for just being called at a revival. Go further and see the justification of God and then continue to walk with him and you'll see the glory fall in your life. Don't settle for bushes when your face can shine. The very Moses who hid his face at a bush cried unto God on the mountain, show me your face. Uh, he was growing into a level of maturity that all started back there with a stutter box. Just to nail this down a little bit so you don't think I'm crazy. Gideon dealt with the exact same insecurity. And let's, let's go watch the Gideon movie and let's collect the Easter eggs and see if we can see some similarities. Judges 6, 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Hold up. Let's paint the picture. Let's get in the context. Do you know where Gideon is at this moment? He's in a wine press, hiding from the Midianites. Let me help you with that, okay? What you typically do with wheat in any given day is you go out into the fields and you're laughing with your neighbor and you got your sickle and you cut down the wheat and you throw it on your shoulder and you walk over to the threshing floor where they take the wheat, they take it off their shoulder and they beat it on the ground and all the little gleanings is what they're called, it falls off the wheat. They collect all that and they put it into that stone and they press it down until it turns into their meal and that's how they make their bread. That's a normal day. 
Well, the Midianites came into the promised land, and now they're, they're fighting them, and they're, they're taking their food. So Gideon now has to take that wheat, and he can't go to the threshing floor. He has to go real quiet by night. He has to go down into a six-foot hole, the wine press, and he's got to thresh it in there, and he's got to peek up over the top of the wine press to make sure no Midianites are coming. Put it this way, life's way harder than it used to be a year ago way harder this is like the worst possible way because when you go to the threshing floor the wind blows the wheat away and it just leaves the gleanings life is hunky-dory it's great but in a wine press you have to thresh real quiet you have to take that thresh and you have to go over here and throw it away and then go back and get the gleanings life is terrible Gideon is hiding and an angel of God has the audacity to meet with him in a hole and say the Lord is with you mighty man of valor who I'm a scaredy cat in a hole. Mighty man, is this a joke? Mighty man of valor. Have you seen me? Heaven's a little sarcastic. I think that's a backhanded remark. You're calling me a mighty man of valor? This is what he says to him. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Sounds like a mighty man, don't it? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm glad you brought up that story. Let's talk about that Egypt stuff, because there was a guy who's felt just like you do right now. Now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours. Hit the rewind button. Did you hear what Gideon just said? If the Lord is really with us, why is all this happening? God has forsaken us. Go in this might of yours. Heaven is like endlessly hopeful, aren't they? Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. You starting to see the pattern here? Same scenario, different time in history, different context, same God meeting with another insecure man, and he looks at him and says, I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. I haven't even said yes yet. I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to get this wheat out of here. How can you call me a mighty man of valor while I'm in a wine press? Oh, Gideon, I'm like Dr. Strange. I can see all the, the potential futures. And if you say yes to me, I already see you on a battlefield with 300 men. I already see that as your potential future. If you say yes and submit your will to me, I will make this work. But if you want to do what you want to do, you have your free will. You can stay in that hole all you want to, or you can submit to my plan. And if you do, I will make it work. Because the reason why I'm calling you a mighty man of valor is I have already seen your potential on that battlefield someday. I, in heaven, am looking at what you can be. Yet, in, I don't just see you in the hole. I see you taking an already unreasonably small army and reducing them even further to 300 men. I see you as a mighty man of valor. This is why Paul could say what he did in Romans 8. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. His purpose is the key word. His purpose, not mine. My job is just to simply say, God, thy will be done. Whatever you want, I'll do it. I am called. You just make the plans and I'll follow it. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he has also called. Future, past. Whom he called, he has already justified. Wait a minute. How has he already done it? I haven't even said yes yet. We haven't even finished the revival yet. And Brother Holloway, you're telling me that tomorrow it already works? Absolutely, if you say yes to his purpose. Let me, let me illustrate this. I need, I need three helpers. Let me just show you where God lives. Let me see. Brother Dan, if you don't mind, uh, I'm not going to burn up your, your deltoids tonight. I noticed you were on the guitar this evening. Is that because I, I killed your delts from drums today? <laughs> All right. All right, uh, I've been using you a lot, Pastor Dan. I want you to just rest today. You can come help me. All right, so here, you hold this. 
I'm going to walk in. Brother, you follow me. I don't know how long the state measure. 16 feet. All right, you walk with me. Come this, come this way. All right, you grab this in. And go out until it reaches 16 feet. I don't want to mess up the state measure. Okay, there we go. All right, you stand in the middle. All right, let me just let me play something out for you for a minute just so you can see where God lives for a moment, okay? We have a hard time, and this is why our faith is so fallible because we don't understand the eternal nature of our God. God isn't just here in this room right now. God is already living in tomorrow. Okay, I can see that we need some help with that. Let's do this. You ready? All right. This is Brother Moses. Brother Moses goes on a 40-day fast, right? He goes up to a mountain, and there he sees the hinder parts of God. Show me thy face. I can't do that. I'm going to hide you behind the cleft of the rock. Let's fast forward from this moment, and let's go into the future about 700 or so years. There's another man who goes on a 40-day fast and goes up to another mountain. His name is Elijah. And when he goes up to that mountain, he hears a still, small voice. And it's, it's God's voice. Now let's fast forward a little bit more and let's go into the New Testament about, I want to say, 800 years or so. And there's a man named Jesus who goes on a 40-day fast and he goes up to a mountain called the Mount of Transfiguration. And who's there? Moses and Elijah. Now, let's just, let's do this for a minute. Did Moses and Elijah come down from heaven and have a little reunion and they, they kind of descended down from the heavenly place? Now, we must remember, Jesus hasn't yet been glorified, so there is no calling up yet. So what is really happening here? If Moses, who's way back here, and Elijah, who's here, and then Jesus here, the common denominators, they all went on a 40-day fast up to a mountain. Jesus up there, these two guys come down. What is happening here? Is there a reunion from heaven that hasn't been taught yet because there has no heaven been really taught in the Old Testament yet? That is a new concept. Or did Moses go up into the presence of an eternal God and he stepped out of time for a moment? And up on that mountain, he sees the hinder parts of Jesus Christ. Elijah goes up and he steps out of his time in history and with the eternal God, he is now hearing the voice of Jesus. And then over here, we think this is a grand reunion or all of it is happening at the same time in the eternal. Let me help you with it a little bit more. I want you to imagine a big clock. You know the one with hands on them back in like the day before they, they, they were on your iPhone? You remember those things? They got hands? You know, the, you know what I'm talking about. And there's numbers and all this weird stuff. I want you to imagine where you and I are stuck right now. Me and you live at 707. We live at the end of an hour hand. That's where we're stuck. And that's where all the anxiety of the church lives. Because you can't go back to 6 p.m. tonight. And you get so worked up because I can't go back to 6 and fix that mistake that I made. I can't go back two years ago and say yes to God and step into the calling. I've squandered my life. Also, I have no idea what tomorrow holds. And so what do I do? Is God going to use me? Can God use me? What if I make a mistake? What if I falter? Blah, 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 blah. All these things. We have anxiety because we live at the end of an hour hand. God, however, does not live at the end of the hour hand. God lives at the dot in the center of the clock where he stands and he can see, he can see 12, he can look down at 6, he can look at 3. And this, you better thank God that he is eternal because every time a sinner repents, you are asking him to go back in time somewhere on here and to pour blood on something you did. If God is an eternal, repentance is null and void because God can't go back in time and fix that but he can because God does not live. What he did when he created this world is he stepped out of eternity and he ripped a hole in it and called it time. And he walked on this earth and gave us days and hours. And no man can go forward or backwards, but we can follow the God who lives at the dot in the center. And so for him, it's not prophecy. In God's throne room, he can look across the room and what is 800 years for us, it's just a glance for him. And he says, yeah, I see Elijah over there. I also see myself. So we're going to make man in that image. I already see myself. I'm going to make man in this image, and you're going to be conformed in my image. I already see me in the future. And yet here we are wondering if God can. 
Wouldn't it be so much easier if you and I just surrendered our will to him? You know what God is doing when he gives a prophet a vision and he gives you a word or a dream? He's pulling you out of this temporal for a moment, putting you up in the eternal and letting you see things and then slamming you back in the present and you're like, what did I just see? God says, you're seeing what's in the throne room. It's not just a possibility. It's not just a prophecy. It already is if you say yes. One more illustration. Can I get a little nerdy on you? Keep this up right here. I walked out of an office about two years ago and I was patting myself on the back. I told my wife, I was like, you married the smartest man alive. Zuniga, she's like, what are you talking about? I said, I just broke string theory. <laughs> True story, based on actual events. She's like, what are you talking about? I was like, okay, babe, prepare yourself. And she was like, okay, what's, what's coming? I was like, we live in 3D. I didn't even know what the D was in 3D, y'all. It's dimensions. I didn't even know that. And what that means is up and down is a dimension, left and right is a dimension, forward and backward is a dimension. 3D. I was blown away. This room is 3D. From there to there, I don't know how long, probably 100 feet. From there to there, probably 80 feet. And from here to there, I don't know, probably 40 feet. Give her, give her, that's based off my depth perception. Somebody in the room who actually knows the measurements probably like he's an idiot. But that's 3D. But theoretical physicists are talking about a dimension that is 4D. And in the fourth dimension, what is height, width, and depth? They said time is in the fourth dimension, meaning that time is not something that's forever moving forward. Time is a fixed measurement that you can look at. God lives in 4D. In God's throne room, time is laid out like a tape measure. And God can just step up from his throne and just take a stroll and say, yeah, 800 years is right here. And I can go right back over here to Genesis and I can look at it because it's not moving where I live. It just is. Just like this room isn't moving, it's just laid out. And God can walk over here and he says, yep, I can see over here in Revelation that they all stand before the throne and they worship me saying glory. That's, that's why I showed that to John. That's not a possibility. That is. I'm looking at it. But I can come back over here and I can look at y'all where you are right now in the middle of a pandemic. I got that figured out. Just submit to me and we can figure that out. I can come here and I can zoom in on this little moment right here where you're just a blip on the radar and I can say, yeah, I see you over here baptizing somebody in your bathtub. If you just say, yes, I can get you there. I just need you to walk with me and if I walk with you, I will be what I will be. I will get you there because I see it all. I gave you a vision and I gave you a dream of your ministry thriving. That is what it is. I showed it to you. It's not potential. It is in the heavenly places you're the one who messes it up because you doubt me walk with me and I will get you there you stay with me and I will get you there spend time with me and I will navigate your steps let me help you with the will of God I'm gonna make it really easy lean not to thine own understanding but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy path as you begin to walk humbly he's going to move your foot in the direction it was supposed to go and as you are trying your best to live for him God takes your steps and he says no I'm going to put it over there and if you stumble you stumble towards your father but what we do is we say God I made a mistake you're going to wipe me off the planet God says no you're falling towards me get back up for a righteous man falleth but if he get back up if you'll keep coming after me do you think me as a father when my children start learning how to walk I put obstacles in their way and say come on buddy try to figure it out and I put little divots in the house no I clear the room because I want my kids to get to the father if you are doing everything that you know to do to walk with him, but you don't have it all figured out, lean not to that own understanding in all thy ways. God, I don't know what you're doing, but I acknowledge you in this. God, I don't know why, but I acknowledge you in this. God, I don't know when, but I'm acknowledging you in this. And he leads us, he moves our foot. And God, you will see that someday you're gonna look back and say, oh God, I see your hand all over my life. And you were leading me and guiding me and getting me to a place. Here, let me help you with this. Way back here, I didn't know that when I was buying a piece of property, in Louisiana I didn't even have the money to buy a piece of property I didn't have the money they wanted $48,000 for a piece of property where I live no big deal I was in prayer and I'm talking to God and God speaks to me and he says offer him 32 and I'm like God that's a low ball I'm gonna be embarrassed if I if I put in that offer and God's like I said what I said just do what I said and so I go and I talk to a realtor I'm over here in the timeline and I meet with this realtor and I'm like 
hey, I'm looking at this property, and they're like, congratulations, we lowered the price today to 42000 I was like, ah. Oh. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm that guy. I looked at this realtor, and I said, I spoke to God today, and he told me I'm not to offer a dime above 32. She laughed in my face. And I said, I can put that in as a, an actual, um, I can, like a real quote, right? I can actually turn that in. She was like, absolutely, you can turn it in, but he's not gonna accept it. I was like, turn it in. She turns it in, okay, here in this little timeline. God is speaking to me. I turn in that, that, that offer, and the guy accepts my offer. He, he walks into the room, and this, the realtor that I submitted the offer to, he comes to her, and he looks at her, and he's like, there ain't a chance I'm taking that. That's a low ball. How dare that guy? He walks out of the room. He walks back in, and he says, is that A.J. Holloway? Reverend A.J. Holloway? She was like, yeah, he said he prayed over that land and God told him to offer 32. He said, unreal. She's like, what's unreal? He looked at her and he said, I was visiting a church last Sunday that he was preaching in. He walked up to me and gave me a word. He doesn't know this, but I'm building my house right next door. I want him as my neighbor. I will give it to him for 32,000. I had no idea. I've got dozens and dozens of stories like this. I had no way of knowing it. I build this house, and I'm like, well, this is the best option for us. If God calls us to Timbuktu or Iran, that's where we'll go. Lo and behold, God would call me to pastor 13 minutes from that very house because God sees everything. And what I could not see in the future, God was looking at it and said, all things work together for those who love me. I'm going to have you do this here because I see you pastoring all the way down here. If you just say yes to me, God, I don't want to put in that quote because it's a low ball just do what I say I will be with you and it all works together okay God let me just try it and see lo and behold so I say this humbly what are you worried about you can be seated what are you worried about this whole thing works together for good. God does not just live in this moment. God is in the future. And when we walk with him, God walks with us and he navigates us into that calling. And yes, sometimes he'll navigate us into hard seasons because he knows I'm also conforming you in my image. And the only way to conform you into my image is you're gonna have to go through this dry season. Keep walking with me. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never is what he said. If you stay with me, even in this hard season, it's gonna work out for your good because all things work together for good to those who love me and who are called according to my purpose but the brother Holloway that's not me yes you stutter box it's even for you we stutter he doesn't he said what he said and whatever he says that what is what it is he will be what he will be and he is no respecter of persons so if he did it for me he will do it for every one of you if God has been walking with me through trials he'll walk with you through trials if God has navigated my future he'll navigate yours if God has given me a ministry he'll give you a ministry if God has allowed me to baptize people at swimming pools you'll baptize people at swimming pools if God has allowed me to teach Bible studies he'll allow you to teach Bible studies because he is no respecter of persons I come tonight as a witness of a God that we can all trust together and walk into a future calling and see an end time harvest I promise you that if you will trust him he will lead you you need to get a word from God because when he speaks to you, he doesn't stutter. When he says something to you, that's what it is. Write it in your journal and you walk every day and say, God, I haven't seen it yet, but I believe it's coming any day now. And if it doesn't come in a year, you'll find me in a year still walking with you. God, if it doesn't happen in two years, I'm not going anywhere. I will be with you as you will be with me. I trust you, God. I'm walking with you, God. Lead me. Musicians, get ready. Does this mean that I'm predestined to be victorious no matter what? Nope. 1 Samuel 13, 13. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. 
but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept the Lord. You have not done what the Lord has commanded you. This is the moment, though. Your job is easy. Just die to your will. Just say, God, not my will, thy will. Not my will, your will. Not my will, your will. And God will order your steps. It's really easy, even on the hard days. Acknowledge him. Find something in the day that you can acknowledge him for. God, I had a flat tire, but I'm acknowledging you. Maybe you kept me from a wreck in the future. God, I, I, I'm broke right now. Maybe that's my own fault, or maybe you're keeping me from a bad financial decision, and this is the only way to get there. God, I acknowledge you. If we can do that, God will lead us. I believe that every single church in America has God's hand on it and has God's future approval on it. It's just people need to learn how to look towards the God who is not bound by the present. He is not stuck in the past and he is not obsessed with the future. He is in all of those places and he knows how to go in your past and clean it up. He knows how to call you in the present and how to bring you to the burning mountain with glory in the future. That is God's good pleasure for every one of you and I promise you that if you will surrender your will, God will bring you to those places. He wants two things from you, your will and your trust. There's a painting. It was in the Louvre. I went to the Louvre in Paris on a mission trip several years ago, and I heard the story of a painting there. I don't know if I have the picture in that slide. I don't, it may not be on there. There is a picture that used to be in the Louvre. There it is. This picture was called Checkmate. It's called Checkmate because the artist depicted some precious soul playing chess against our adversary. And he painted it in a way where they're bargaining for the soul. If the young man loses, he has to give his soul to the adversary. If the young man wins, he gets to go free. And it's painted that the adversary has him in checkmate, thus the name Checkmate. Well, there was a famous chess player who went to the Louvre, and he stood and looked at this painting for hours, analyzing it. He was a world-renowned chess player. After several hours of looking at it, finally you could see something come over his face, an enlightenment, and he cried out for the curator. He said, get me the curator! Curator runs and he says, change the name of the painting. He said, what are you talking about? He said, it's a lie. It's not checkmate. He said, what do you mean it's not checkmate? He said, I have played chess all my life and I am a grandmaster. The young man's got one move left. His king has a move. And if he will use his king, he wins the game. You understand that the God you serve does not lose. The times where we see calamity, it's where humans didn't surrender. But not for this church. If you could just say, God, you are my king, you move me on the board. Let's face it, we're the pawns. We are the pieces that God is moving us. Paul said it. Can the vessel, can the creature say to the creator, I have no need of you? We don't get to choose. For the past seven years, God has poured into this vessel evangelists. And for the past seven years, he's been doing this, just pouring me out over North America. And then for the past year, Brother Zuniga, it's just been like he did this, and I'm just, there's nothing left. And I'm just, God, what's next? What do you want me to do? I don't, I don't, I've gone on vacations. I have prayed. I fasted, and I don't feel like you're filling the cup back up. All of a sudden, I started feeling something in my heart. I didn't know what it was. I started feeling a tug. And then I didn't open any doors. I'm just walking. All of a sudden, the pastor of the church in Ball, Louisiana, he sits down with me, and he says, if you ever feel called to pastor, the door's open here. I said, brother, I can't even think about that right now. I've got three camps out in front of me. I need to focus on that. But I'll pray about it during those camps. As I'm just walking, ministering as I am, wasn't looking for a church to pastor. Contrary to popular belief, not every evangelist is out here looking for a church. <laughs> I just want the next thing he wants from me. And I'm walking. And I find myself at a youth camp, Brother Zuniga. 
some random person walks up to me. I'm not kidding, y'all. Let me just tell y'all how this stuff works. I don't have to stress anything. All I got to do is walk. Some person came up and shook my hand, and they said, how are you doing, Pastor Holloway? I looked at them, and I was like, you know I'm not a pastor, right? She looked at me, and she said, I felt that prophetically over you. No one on this planet knew that I was praying about a church. And I could easily take it as like, okay, God, honest mistake. I'm not going to go past the church because one person shook my hand. The next night, some guy walks up to me. He had no idea that two months before this moment, God spoke to me. He said these words, what you've been doing for the past six years won't get you into year seven. He walks up to me and said, the Lord gave me a dream about you last night. I said, what was the dream? He said, I saw a long table. You were on this end. Your wife was on this end. And there were six burning coals sitting on that table. He said, angels descended from heaven and they gathered all the coals together and they handed it to you. It turned into a seventh candle. And you and your wife held it up. He said, I don't know what that means, but I have to tell it to you. I went into prayer and God said, what I've had you do for the past six years is bringing in you into year seven. I said, God, what does that mean? I was flying to Colorado the whole day when all the computers went down. You remember the whole crowd strike thing where the computers shut down? I was flying that day, okay? And I'm just walking through. I'm as ignorant as the day is long. I live under a rock, y'all. I'm just walking along, and I see like 800 people in line trying to change their flights. And I was like, man, that's weird. So I just walked right past. I hop on my plane. I fly to Colorado. Never had a hiccup, never anything. I land in Colorado, and they're like, did you hear what happened? I was like, what happened? And they're like, every plane shut down. I was like, for real? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, I didn't have a single problem. <laughs> so I walk, I get in the car, and this pastor picks me up, and he looks at me, he said, you're supposed to be here. I said, I think I am, because I had not, evidently something bad happened today, and I'm here. He looks at me, and he says these words, the Lord gave me a word for you. He said, David operated at half capacity for six years until he went into year seven. He said, you're going into year seven and that's the thing God has designed for you. I looked at him and I said, hey, you have no idea. We're making plans. I'm going to be pastoring and it's beginning at year seven. I'm just walking. Just walking through airports. Just walking through crowd strike. Walking through problems and God's just leading my steps. God led me right to the place house is built church they announced it to the church one of the board members starts crying at the church we're about to pastor he's sobbing and we're like it's not that we're not that bad of people what are you crying for and he's like your grandfather was my pastor I looked at him and I said are you kidding me he said no your grandfather also married my wife and I he said I can't believe that you're going to be my pastor when your grandpa was my pastor I didn't even know he knew my grandpa. He is ordering and he's working. Oh, he's got a move left. And he's moving me on the board. I'm just a pawn, God. If you poured it out, you fill me up with pastor. That's your prerogative. I don't know what, what you want. Just fill me up, God. Whatever you want to pour in the vessel, that's what I'll be. I die, fill me up with what you want, and I will live an overflowing life. And I'm calling every person in this room. I want your faith to be elevated. That if God has called you to do something, he didn't call it to be a fail. He did not call it to fall apart. He has called it to be prosperous. He has called it to be glorious. He has called it to bring you from the bush to the mountain to the shining face so I want you to come to these altars right now and I want you to lift your faith up unto heaven and say God you called me and I trust the plan I believe that you're gonna lead me you're gonna send me God it works together for good listen to what Paul says after our opening text Romans 8 35 who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the rest of the scripture after he said, for those to whom he knew, he called. So this all works together. And you don't have to worry about things present, nor things to come. God orders your steps. And so I want your faith to be high right now. You've gone deep this week. Now I want your faith to be brought up to heavenly places. With those hands raised, let go of every reservation 
salvation. Let go if, will it work? Let go of, could it be? What if, what if? Let go of all of that and hear these words. I will be with you. I will walk with you. I will order your steps. I will lead you. I will guide you. I will put the words in your mouth. Give no thought to what you will say. You just go and I will be with you. Don't worry about how it's going to work out. If God has given you a word or a vision or a dream, trust me, God is in it. He's going to walk with you till you see it. Don't lose heart. Don't worry about if it will happen. That's not your concern. Give no thought to tomorrow for tomorrow will take care of itself. Tomorrow has enough trouble. You just keep walking today. Keep making steps today. And I promise you this from heaven as witness and testimony. If you surrender to him on this time map, God will get you to the next day. He'll get you to the next year. You will see what he showed you. You will have that powerful ministry God has shown you. You will walk in heavenly places. Your desire is what I'm after right now. Here's what I want. I want you to lift up your hunger and your desire. God, I want what you want for me. That's your only prayer right now. You don't have to stress about what next. Just say, God, I want it. Whatever you have for me, I want that. Go after it with all of your heart right now. Let him speak to you. God, I want to be used of you. God, I want to be used of you. God, I want to walk in those places. God, that's all I know to do is to want it. It's your job to do it.